Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. On today's program, we'll step back in time to the summer of love and look back at Woodstock 50 years later with never before heard insight into the creation of the festival and reviving Ophelia. We delve inside the new film that gives a fresh voice to Hamlet's tragic heroine. But first. Catching up with Istanbul's jam-packed jazz festival, we sit down with one of its world-renowned performers to get a taste of this year's offerings. No wallflowers here. Instead, these wildflowers are blossoming at a new exhibition right here in Istanbul. If we could see the miracle of a single flower, our whole life would change. This is what the Buddha once said, and now nowhere is this philosophy more evident and inspirational than at a gallery right here in Istanbul, where a Turkish artist's unique portrayal of wildflowers is blossoming. Showcase's Sena Arslan went there to check it out. I prefer the silence and tranquility of the long walks in nature when my mind is on a creative rush. But as soon as the creative process starts, I listen to psychedelic music to further deepen my connection to nature. I realized that what triggered me most artistically were these walks and the bright colors that came across my path. He wants to put you under the spell of colors and textures. These are Turkish painter Nejat Sutter's abstraction of wild flowers. It is a conceptual deconstruction. Each piece represents a petal. This one, for example, the petal of an artichoke flower. And this here, of a carnivorous plant. Nejat has been active in the art scene for over a decade. I used to focus more on the mathematics of painting, the composition. But last year, upon my walks in nature, I decided to make abstractions out of the different color combinations in flowers. Instead of using the flowers as a whole object, I focused on a specific part of it, the petal, and on the change of colors there. I wanted to mimic the impression and effect that the flowers leave on us. For the artist, color is a means to creating this effect. It's emotive, private, but at the same time, intersubjective and effable. Like each of us, every color is unique. And it's through colors, Nejat can appeal to the idea of an essence in human existence. The flowers I used in this series are part of a Northern American flora. But this wasn't consciously done. I just came by a botanical book from the 1980s one day and wanted to start off from there, because the imagery and colors in old publications are more accurate. Nejat Sutu hopes to extend this series even further, both in terms of canvas scale and range of flowers. Sena Arslan, TRT World, Istanbul. From elaborate concert halls to leafy parks and even on passenger ferries crossing the Bosphorus, the sounds of jazz are ringing out across the city. This year's 26th Istanbul Jazz Festival is in full swing, with celebrated musicians from all over the world doing their thing. Prominent names, including Joss Stone, Kamasi Washington and Snarky Puppy, have been treating audiences to an eclectic array of dynamic performances. One of the festival's most popular events, Jazz in the Parks, offered up al fresco jazz, accessible to everyone. The festival ends on July the 18th, with crescendo performances from a couple of major talents, the two-time Grammy winner musician Jacob Collier and beat scientist Makaya McCraven. 
One of the biggest names performing at this year's festival is Aydın Esen, who is known for his captivating improvisations, blending fusion jazz and boss pop. He joins me now in the studio. Thank you so much for My coming pleasure. to our studio Thanks. today. Thank you. Well, I started by defining your music with some titles and terms and classifications, but I wonder how you feel about all these, really. Yes, I know. Uh, it's not a new thing, really. It's been, it's been a while right now, putting music in different levels and different names. Even I do get sometimes almost uncomfortable. <laughs> but again, I always look at music as, as, as one, one sound, one general sound that we all do love. But again, we have to accept it. And uh, jazz being probably the most adventurous, I would say, uh, along with the classical and contemporary uh, classical music with electronics, I really wouldn't mind. It's like a little game that we never get tired of playing with ourselves or with the audiences because we're one of those. So uh, at the end, I'm all for one sound, a good sound. I am curious whether you see yourself as a Turkish artist, because you grew up in Turkey, course, but then you got educated in the US and your sound for me is pretty global, but I wonder how you feel about that balance between local and global. Globally, yes, of course, I'm a global musician because that's this how what I know. So that means being Turkish is in it somewhere, and, uh, but I don't really like to show it uh, directly and, uh, to the audience, which is myself and all the audiences, you know, because I look at it like, you know, you know, a sound piece of, you know, you can even say art, and we don't have to really call everything art these days because good sound is just a sound is almost, I don't know. It's, I think it's the art of all arts for me, <laughs> you know, sound, art of sound, if you want to use that very correctly, which I barely started using it uh, <laughs> secretly because the appreciation level is so high. So, should I feel, is it, is it safe to say that Aydın Esen is a Turkish jazz musician? No, jazz is not the wrong, I mean, right term really for me. Okay. Uh, I usually sometimes look at the international press just to kind of, you know, know who Aydın Esen is because I read. Mm -hmm. You know, I just listen, you know, I observe too. Yes, in my head, I'm just a bound, you know, global writer or, or composer and a keyboard player or electronics artist because I know about modern music a lot. We grew up with classical music. We know about the combinations of it. Jazz is great, but jazz is not everything. So we do a lot more than just jazz. So I would just say uh, musician and call it. I want to hear your thoughts about the jazz scene in Turkey. How, how lively is it? How dynamic? How creative? What do you think? Great scene nowadays. They make great records. And the only thing they have to do is, I think, travel more maybe, share with outsiders more, not just uh, think that they're just mere, they're going to end up staying here. It's, music is kind of little, wants you to kind of walk around, travel around. This will be helpful. Other than that, Great you find talents. it lightly. I mean, there is a lot of debate always going on around whether jazz is relevant today, whether it's, um, you know, staying at its ivory tower or is it like, you know, um, connecting to the audiences. People are, I think, liking it a lot more because of the festivals and talking about it and then the crowds uh, watch each other what is my friend liking, or I don't know, what is he liking, he's liking. It's almost like, you know, it's like you're reading a book, you know, whatever people do, you do, and then as far as I can see, there's a lot of jazz and cross stuff going on in the world, and I'm so psyched about it. People getting their brains enlarged by just, just being there. I love it, I love it. And um, looking at Istanbul Jazz Festival, I can safely say that. It's very relevant, at least to Istanbul audience, because it was really crowded. Istanbul audience is the yes. best. Well, Aydın Esen, what a Thank pleasure so to much. host you on My our show. My pleasure. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks so Thank much. you. Thousands of movies are made around the world each year, but only a handful make it to the international arena. TRT's brand new project, 12 Puntos Script Days, is aiming at helping Turkish movies break down barriers and gain international success. And the first edition of the event wrapped up with eight film projects being given the kind of production and financial assistance that will help them go global. 
Turkey's public broadcaster continues to support the young filmmakers to better represent Turkish cinema. 12 Punto Script Days was the latest edition of such efforts. TRT Script Days enabled us to meet and work with so many international script doctors. We work together on our scripts and they explain to us how we should revise our projects to be able to take part in the international festivals. The film industry's respected professionals concluded that with the right kind of support, Turkish cinema could reach a global audience. TRT Script Days reminded me of the support that our Ministry of Culture provides for filmmakers. Because in the beginning of the 2000s, it helped a great deal for our national cinema to develop. This event has a potential to help our cinema to be great and to reach out to an international audience. 12 Punto Script Days focused on how to tell better stories while keeping a local identity and at the same time reaching for international quality and standards in filmmaking. As the public broadcaster, we believe the importance of the stories coming out of from Turkey and this land, uh, this geography. And 12 Punto Secret Writing Days is, is supporting and creating opportunities for the new secret writers uh, to develop their stories and to pitch them to internationally uh, known uh, ju to juries. The president of the jury of the Tuvalu Punto is also the president of the Academy of uh, Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, and this is the, we we feel very lucky that he accepted our invitation and came to Turkey for the for the pitching. TRT will continue to support and encourage filmmakers and scriptwriters to tell their stories in the hope of promoting Turkish cinema. You forget how to greet a king! Vengeance is mine. And now, it can be yours. A new motion picture brings a contemporary perspective to William Shakespeare's centuries-old epic play, Hamlet, in a way never seen before. It was the freedom of being able to be who you were, not feeling that somebody was going to judge you. Fifty years of peace and love and groovy music. A new documentary revisits the epic music festival, Woodstock in an unrivaled way. Peace, love, music and a lot of rain. In August of 1969, around half a million people flocked to a farm in upstate New York. Back then, no one knew that this three-day extravaganza known as Woodstock would spark a cultural revolution. In the past 50 years, this legendary music festival inspired dozens of books and several films. But now, a new documentary is telling the story in an entirely new way. I had never seen that many people in my life in one place at one time. Woodstock, three days that defined a generation, stands out among other Woodstock films because it focuses on the festival goers rather than the performers. Its makers unearthed nearly 40 hours of never-before-seen footage that had been sitting at the Warner Brothers studios all this time. The documentary tells the story of the political and social turmoil leading up to those three historic days, as well as the extraordinary events of the concert itself. For more on Woodstock three days that defined a generation, Let's cross over to New York now, where the producer and co-director of the documentary, Jamila Efron, joins me. So Jamila, you are not focusing on music in this documentary, but the festival goers. Why is that? Well, you know, the, one of the best concert films ever made was made about Woodstock back in 1971. Um, and we really felt that there was nothing we could add to the conversation about music. But what was unexplored were the stories of the people who had gone there. And the more we kind of spoke to the attendees, we realized that the reason that the event was so special and, and such a searing experience for them was not actually because of the music they heard. It was the sort of community they found there and the power they, they, they took from, from knowing there were so many people that were like-minded and going through similar things at that moment. 
I wonder what you're bringing new to the table, any details that we haven't heard before? Well, um, you know, I'm not sure that there's there's been uh, a film that's actually looked at the context um, that the, this festival grew out of. I mean, this what we what we tried to do was place the experiences of these festival goers in the moment that they were living through. So, so this happened in a moment of incredible turbulence in the United States. Um, the, these kids had sort of lost hope in the, the older generation. They were very alienated from their parents' generation. They were facing the draft. The civil rights movement was raging. Uh, the sort of sexual revolution was also ra waging, raging. And, uh, you know, they, they, they were sort of lost looking for something, and they, they found it at this festival. So w what we tried to do was sort of go back and tell the story of, of before the festival and, and sort of profile what it was like to be to be a young person at this moment in time. Mm, and you mentioned 1971 movie uh, Woodstock. I wonder where your film is positioned in relation to this original documentary. For example, uh, Christian Galicia, a reviewer from The Playlist, thinks it serves as an unofficial companion piece. Would you agree on that? Well, our film owes an incredible debt of gratitude to that original film. Um, we, you know, we wouldn't have been able to make our film without that one. They, the, the, the story of, of the making of the original film should be a film in and of itself. Um, but we knew that there were these just hours and hours and hours of outtakes from that uh, original film. Um, that, that Most of the cameras were pointed at the stage, but there were several that were roaming the the fields and spending time with the festival goers. And so what we tried to do was sort of get get at these sort of lost outtakes. Um, they were in storage at Warner Brothers for almost 50 years. And and without that, we wouldn't really have the substance of our film. So so our job was to kind of unearth those and bring them bring them back to life. And um, without the, the sort of team of, of ragtag hippie filmmakers who shot it in the first place, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have the original film and we certainly wouldn't have our film either. Mm. And um, I want to talk a little bit about the legacy of Woodstock today. Because sometimes I feel like we do romanticize it a bit too much. I mean, do you really think that it was three days of peace, love and music and it was just three days that defined a generation, really? How is, how is the document, how is your documentary's take on it? Well, you know, it was, it was three days of, of many things. Um, there were, you know, there were several crises. There were several near disasters. Um, the story... What's amazing about the story was how close to the brink they came of of an actual humanitarian crisis happening. At the, they were totally unprepared for this many people to arrive, um, and yet they were able to pull together in large part because of the goodwill of the attendees, the the sort of desire that so many people seemed to feel that they wanted this to be okay, they wanted it to work, they wanted to to give each other what they had to share and to be peaceful and loving. And so, in that sense, I think it was was actually three days of, of peace, love, and music. Um, why was it so searing? Why does, why, you know, the, the thing that's so profound about it is these people, you know, almost 50 years on, are still moved to tears remembering that weekend. You know, I, I think there probably is an element of nostalgia there that, that's, that's contributing to that, but I think it was that it showed them what humanity could be, that in this sort of, this moment of crisis, they pulled together and just, they, they just loved each other. They made good on the values of, of the, the hippie generation. Yeah, and let's see if that original Woodstock spirit will be emulated this year at Woodstock 50 event. Well, Jamila Efron, thank you so much for joining us today on Showcase. Thank you for having me. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, William Shakespeare is the most filmed author of all time, with more than 400 productions recreating or taking inspiration from his many works. And one of his most famous tragedies, Hamlet, has been a staple in motion pictures since the turn of the century. Each screen adaptation of this tale of murderous revenge brought out a different side of the original. And now, as showcases Ali Jan Pamir tells us, the latest incarnation of Hamlet is challenging the norms of cinematic storytelling like no other. Hamlet, the world's most famous play. Hamlet, 
written playwright William Shakespeare's tragic story of the Prince of Denmark, who sets out to avenge his father's death, was first elevated to celluloid icon status through thespian Laurence Olivier's portrayal of him in the 1948 movie of the same name. Despite being criticized for cutting several story threads from the original text, Olivier managed to bring a character study quality to this epic tale by solely focusing on his character. Have you your father's leave? What's his 1969 saw British New Wave director Tony Richardson's low-budget riff on Hamlet. This first color version of the timeless tale of retribution had modern energetic camera work, but suffered greatly from miscasting. And now my cousin Hamlet and my son. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? To be or not to be. Just like Olivier, Another theater actor turned director, Kenneth Branagh, tackled the popular Shakespeare play in 1996. This rendition has attracted attention for being a very faithful adaptation of the complete text, which made for a four-hour running time. As a result, Hamlet was finally allowed its place in the annals of cinema as a legitimate epic. Surprisingly, the story of the famous tragedy lent itself to other genres as well, like in the cheap Italian spaghetti western Johnny Hamlet. Set during the American Civil War, this production took its place in film history as an interesting example of a free literature adaptation. Walt Disney Studios took this approach one step further when they set the story in Africa instead of Denmark with Lion King. To this day, the 45 million budget blockbuster remains as the highest grossing hand-drawn animation of all time. Exactly why? What? What? Why? Why what exactly? Why is he mad? I don't know! Britain wordsmith Tom Stoppard, who won an Oscar for writing Shakespeare in Love in 1999, brought a fresh approach to Hamlet, with his Rosencrantz and Guldenstern are dead movie. The film presents a dramatic narrative shift by telling the famous story from the perspective of two side characters, instead of following the main leads. Wasn't that the end? Do you call that an ending? With practically everyone still on his feet? My goodness, no! Over your dead body! Tell me what is inside a person. And now, an all-female perspective is introduced to Hamlet by director Claire McCarthy, who frames her film from the point of view of Ophelia, the love interest of the doomed Danish prince. This new look at an old play has been a welcome addition to the Shakespeare canon. The makers of the movie, however, insist that in essence, their movie is not about subversion of conventions, but about celebrating the works of Shakespeare. That's the thing, and, and I think that was always the intention, to make it accessible, to keep Shakespeare alive, because the language and the stories were so good. Um, and it is, you know, we're not as open to it now, because obviously times have changed, and, and this is a way to keep it alive and hopefully not alienate those ones who are super snobby about it as well. Um, but, yeah, to have it from the female point of view, driven from the female point of view, and not just Ophelia, um, but Gertrude and her sister, but also we have behind the scenes Claire McCarthy directing it, Semi uh, Chalice who wrote the screenplay and adapted it from Lisa Klein's book. So um, it's a great team of women and a great example of how um, women working well together, women supporting women, and um, and this is the new time that we're in, that people are open to f those kind of female-driven projects. Are you afraid? You will only be safe if you are afraid. 
and it seems like everyone and their aunts agree. Reviews suggest that Ophelia translates to the screen as that rare example, which brings a woman's vision to a strictly male narrative and manages to keep Shakespeare's original spirit alive along the way. Thanks for joining us here on Showcase. If you're looking for more of our coverage of the global art scene, you can find it on our YouTube channel. I'm Elif Bereketli. See you next time.